Hi everyone, my name is Alexis Kwan. I'm a Barrett student studying political science and nonprofit management. And my name is Justin Haywood, studying political science and Spanish with a minor in civic economic thought and leadership. We are members of the Student Advisory Board for the School of Civic and Economic Thought and Leadership, also known as the Skettle Diplomats. Skettle has provided me with opportunities to dig deeper into political and philosophical texts, apply civic leadership globally through programming in India, and engage with professionals through the ASU Skettle events. For me, I joined Skettle because after taking a course with Dr. German, I realized that with political science, I was not given the same emphasis on classical works and political theory that I received with my Skettle courses. Skettle has provided me a deeper understanding of the philosophical tenets and uh, of political science that a liberal arts education should provide. This is why I've decided to join Skettle and will continue to be involved in the school going forward. Now, enough from us. Without further ado, we will introduce Professor Paul Carice. Professor Carice is the founding director of the School of Civic Economic Thought and Leadership at Arizona State University. For nearly two decades, he was a professor of political science at the United States Air Force Academy. He has held fellowships at Harvard University, the University of Delhi as a Fulbright Fellow, and the James Madison Program at Princeton University. And without further ado, Professor Carice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon or good evening. Um, we're delighted you could be here. This is the uh, fifth and final event in the fall portion of the school series on polarization and civil disagreement addressing America's civic crisis. Uh, we will start up again in January with a bang. Um, the series, for those of you who have participated so far, includes uh, some dialogue events like this, um, some individual speakers. We have a two-day conference in February with a mix of individual speakers and, and dialogue events. Uh, we are very glad to be co-sponsoring the entire series with two ASU partners who joined us last year, or with us again this year, the O'Connor College of Law and the Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication. And as you can see, we're also glad to be partnering once again with Arizona PBS. Uh, and as you saw, we have a special student theme uh, to this event. We have special uh, student group co-sponsors for the event, and I'll uh, speak about them later. The videos for all of our events, last year's series on free speech and intellectual diversity, this year's series, Polarization and Civil Disagreement, uh, they are all available on our website, the shorter versions that Arizona PBS produces and then the full la length version. Nearly 4,000 members of the ASU and broader Phoenix communities attended all of our public events last year, so we ask you to spread the word about our programs. The aim of our public affairs programs is to provide a public forum for civil disagreement and debate. Uh, and I'm glad to see colleagues from different departments of the university. We also got some RSVPs from members of the state legislature. We'll see if, if I can find them by the end of the, the event. Uh, all the speaker events that the school organizes express in a public way our core mission, to restore the connection between liberal education and civic education in a university, and to undertake civic education with the broader community. Of course, for the students, we encourage you to get information that's outside at our tables about our major, our minor, our courses, some of our unconventional experiential leadership courses, for example, a, a, a course in India and a course in Israel and the West Bank, and also our one-week course on Shakespearean leadership. Um, one theme relevant to this particular event, uh, after a heated uh, electoral season and all of our electoral seasons seem to be so heated uh, recently, especially uh, with episodes of violence. Um, we think that our approach to liberal education and civic education, restoring some focus on fundamental ideas and fundamental debates, can provide a broader and calming perspective in our polarized and divided times. Last year's major series, as I mentioned, was on the contentious issue in higher education and American politics of free speech and intellectual diversity. We thought this year we should extend that theme to discuss um, the deeper issues behind that controversy, the division into self-sorting parties and ways of thought that demonize opposing points of view, which we call negative partisanship or polarization. Because the polarized and sorted intellectual climate within universities is related to that broader division and polarization, 
we thought a university department had a special responsibility to address it. And so to today's event and our two expert speakers to help us sort through the recent national election and to identify lessons for the two major parties, but also some general indications about the state of America's political culture, we have with us a Republican pollster expert and a Democratic pollster expert. Uh, Kristen Anderson and Marjorie O'Mara uh, Marjorie O'Mara also embody one of the civic virtues that we're interested in. Um, while they uh, each identify openly with a major political party, they are open to reasonable argument with a member of the other party. And they demonstrate this regularly in a podcast that they host weekly called The Poster, Pollsters. So to introduce each of them, Kristen Soltis Anderson is a pollster and co-founder of Echelon Insights a research and analytics firm. Prior to launching Echelon, she was the vice president of the Winston Group, a Republican polling firm. She's author of The Selfie Vote, Where Millennials Are Leading America and How Republicans Can Keep Up. She was listed by Time as one of 30 under 30 changing the world and featured by Elle magazine as one of the most compelling women in Washington. She's an ABC News political contributor a columnist at the Washington Examiner, and she regularly appears on programs such as Morning Joe, Fox News Sunday, Real Time with Bill Maher. In 2014, Anderson was a resident fellow at the Harvard Institute of Politics. Her research on millennial attitudes has been featured in the New York Times Magazine, and she regularly speaks about this to corporate leaders and public officials. Margie Omero is Executive Vice President of Public Affairs at PSB Research, a strategic research company. Across two decades, her clients have included companies such as Kellogg's, McDonald's, and Walmart, as well as nonprofit and advocacy groups such as the Center for American Progress, Every Town for Gun Safety, and Compassion and Choices. Omero has appeared on programs such as CNN's The Situation Room, MSNBC's Hardball, Fox News Channel's O'Reilly Factor, and NPR's Diane Rehm Show. She has also appeared in print in the New York Times, the Washington Post, and USA Today. She also speaks regularly to a variety of groups, students, lawmakers, business leaders, and journalists, and she has been named one of the 50 politicos to watch by Politico, a mover and shaker by Campaigns and Elections Magazine, and a young woman of achievement by the Women's Information Network. Also, Rookie of the Year by the American Association of Political Consultants. Our two guests are about to uh, share a dialogue, much like they do in their podcast, for about 25 or 30 minutes. And then in the second part of the program, I'll pose some uh, reasonable uh, questions to them. And then we have uh, lined up for you uh, four students to ask the opening questions of the event. Leaders from Bridge ASU, from undergraduate student government here on the Tempe campus, campus uh, from the ASU Young Democrats, and from the ASU College Republicans United. After all of that, there should be a little bit of time for questions just from the audience. And of course, for the students and others here, we have not just a reception afterward, but a taco bar. <laughs> we hope to feed a spirit of civic friendship and continued discussion as well as feeding your bodies. So with that, please join me in welcoming the pollsters, Kristen Soltis Anderson and Margie O'Mara. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I will kick things off. Uh, thank you so much for inviting us to be here today. I'm especially excited about the taco bar, uh, but hopefully we'll keep you engaged uh, and, and entertained for the next, uh, next little while before we get to taco bar. Uh, if you are an ASU Democrat, you are probably very excited about the election of alumna Kirsten Sinema to the U.S. Senate. And if you are an ASU Republican, I assume you are excited about the re-election of ASU alum Doug Ducey to the governor's mansion. Uh, I think that the fact that Arizona is a state that at a statewide level broke in two different directions in the very same election uh, is fascinating. Tells us, uh, I think, a little bit about what this election means and where America is headed. Um, I've got three, I, I think, somewhat formed takeaways coming out of this election. Of course, ballots are still being counted. In some places, my home state of Florida, they are being recounted. Uh, recounts, Tim Tebow, orange juice, these are among our chief exports. Uh, so hopefully we'll find out soon who the winner was there. Um, but I, I've come away from this midterm 
with kind of three big thoughts about what we learned. Uh, the first is incredibly self-serving. It's that the polls are all right. Uh, I was a little down on the polling industry the day after uh, the election in 2016. Uh, and after this midterm, you know, we taped an episode of our podcast that very next morning, and I sort of gave the polling industry a C plus, uh, a passing grade, but still needs improvement. And part of that was because the polls had suggested that the Indiana Senate race would be close, and it wasn't. It suggested that the Missouri Senate race would be a nail biter, and it wasn't. It suggested that Democrats had a somewhat, not, I wouldn't say comfortable, but we're, we're in the, the lead in Florida, and that wound up not being the case. Um, so there were some big marquee races where it seemed as though the polling told one story, but the election went the other way. But upon reflection, I think pollsters get, uh, you know, when, when those little, when individual races, the polls are off by four or five points in one direction, that's what everyone focuses on. But by and large, the portrait of what this election was going to be like before Election Day wound up panning out. Uh, 538 said before the election that there was about an 85% chance that Democrats would take the House and that they would do so with a margin around 35 seats. That looks like, once all these ballots are counted, about where we're going to be sitting. Uh, in the Senate, it was expected that Republicans had an 85% chance of keeping the Senate and would probably pick up a seat. That looks likely to be what the outcome will be. So overall, I think first and foremost, I say the pollsters got it pretty close to right. Now, we as pollsters are always looking at our methods, making sure that we're learning, trying to improve, do better. And it's certainly the case that it's really hard to do polling these days. Uh, the New York Times Upshot blog uh, did thousands upon thousands upon thousands of phone calls to voters living in key swing districts. And they were very transparent about just how difficult it was for them to even conduct these polls. They would call 30,000 people in a congressional district just to get 400, 500 completed phone calls. And yet, when all was said and done, their polls gave a pretty accurate picture of how the House was likely to break and the types of districts where Democrats were likely to make gains. So my first big takeaway is maybe I'm, I'm upgrading my, my initial grade that I gave the polls from a, maybe a C plus to a B, B plus. Uh, I think it was overall a pretty good night for our industry. I think the second big thing that I took away from this midterm is that the idea of red states and blue states I think is increasingly outdated. Now what's funny is a lot of the big headlines the day after the election said red states got redder and blue states got bluer. Uh, I went, I was just this morning, I was working on a column and I Googled to see how many people had had that as a headline of their own column within the last week and it was, it was many. Uh, the idea that you know, red America got redder and blue America got bluer, I think is undercut in part by results like we saw here in Arizona, where voters within one state chose one party for one office and another party for another. Um, you saw states like Maryland, Massachusetts, re-elect Republican governors and by healthy margins, while red states like Kansas elected Democratic governors. Um, what I think my big takeaway was from the ge about the geography of how this election played out is that suburbs in red states and suburbs in blue states are behaving an awful lot alike politically. Um, and that how dense an area you live in may tell someone like me a lot more about how you might vote than whether you live in a red state or a blue state. There's been a lot of talk around uh, globalization and you know, sort of the, the changing world and how folks that live in a city like Paris or London or New York may have lives that are more similar to one another than people who live in their own country. Someone who lives in New York City, their life might be more similar to someone who lives in Paris than someone who lives in upstate New York, not too far away. Um, the idea that the, the type of place you live tells more about your, your identity, your lifestyle, your beliefs, um, uh, you know, in terms of the density rather than the pure geography. And I wonder if in this election we're seeing the suburbs beginning to behave more like the very blue cities that they are around. Um, take, for instance, where so many of the Republicans' uh, House losses were. Yes, there were big losses in suburbs in California, suburbs in Illinois, suburbs in New Jersey, blue states. But there were also losses in suburbs of Dallas, of Houston. Uh, there were big losses in suburbs of Oklahoma City, uh, Salt Lake City. These are not 
Democratic hotbeds, and yet they were the sort of place where voters were frustrated, fed up by what they're seeing in Washington, and were open to a candidate from the other party, who they may not have voted for two years ago, but they wanted to see some change. So I think for Republicans in putting together a majority in the future have got to first and foremost figure out why is it that suburbs, even in red states, are not behaving like red state kind of places? And what is it that Republicans can do to win them back? And I think linked to that is my third big takeaway, which is that there are some hugely influential voting blocks that moved away from the GOP. Even in a year where the economy is doing well and voters give President Trump a, a, a credit for that, um, even in an election where President Trump was able to get his voters out to the ballot boxes, you know, typically in a wave election, one party is energized, the other party is depressed. In 2006, you had Democratic voters very energized, Republican voters kind of disappointed in President Bush, and they stayed home. In 2010 and 2014, you saw Republican voters very energized, Democratic voters somewhat less so. This election, Republicans and Democrats were energized, and Republicans and Democrats were making their vote about the president, either in support or in opposition. Um, so this was an election where the president was on the ballot, even if his name wasn't there. Um, and that's why, given the results, President Trump should be nervous about his reelection chances. Um, groups that Republicans typically rely on, for instance, married women. I can't tell you the number of times I've been in meetings where I've been talking about the importance of winning the women's vote, and people will go, yeah, well, we win married women. Well, in this election, Republicans didn't win married women. Women, uh, white women with college degrees, a constituency that used to split pretty evenly, if not lean a little Republican, broke for the Democrats by 20 points in this election. Or take young voters, a group that I've been studying for a long time. Uh, younger voters back in the election of 2000, the last time Florida had a recount, uh, broke for Al Gore by only about two or three points, which was about the same that their grandparents did about two or three points. There was not really a generational divide in politics uh, back just about 20 years ago. But we now have young voters in this last election, those under the age of 30, according to the exit polls, broke for Democrats by a 35-point margin. That is about the same size as the margin that young people broke for Barack Obama in 2008. And so many of my fellow Republican consultants would tell me, well, it's, that's just an Obama thing. It's just because they're excited about Obama. When he's not on the ballot, they won't vote like that. Well, this election proves that's not true. And the last number that I'll leave you with is what voters in their 30s did. So if you think back to that election, 2008, 10 years ago, Barack Obama wins voters in their 20s by this huge two to one margin. But then they grew up, and I have been hearing from Republican consultants that, well, they'll grow up, they'll get married, they'll have kids, they'll start paying taxes, and then they'll all become Republican. Uh, and now those voters who were in their 20s 10 years ago are now in their 30s, the wonder of math. And it turns out that even though some of them are getting married, not all of them. Some of them are having kids, not all of them. Some of them are paying taxes, maybe not all of them. Uh, but nonetheless, they have gotten older and they have not gotten more Republican. They are still breaking for Democratic candidates by 20 plus point margins. Uh, and this is something the GOP is going to have to contend with. They can't just keep running up the numbers with constituencies that are favorable to them and thinking it will offset the losses with groups like women, groups like Asian Americans, who in this last election voted more heavily Democratic than Latinos. A huge change from the way Asian Americans used to vote in the 1990s. So Republicans have got to catch up with the demographic and cultural change in this country. Um, or have a message that speaks to a broader coalition of people. Um, and so with that, I'm gonna kick it over to Margie, who can talk, I think, a little bit about why Democrats had such a good night uh, and what she thinks this means for the Democratic Party moving forward. Well, thanks. Yeah, and I echo the importance of civility. I mean, I'm very progressive personally. It's, we still really enjoy having our civil conversations. It's, uh, you know, it is, really like a source of joy to have a bipartisan moment. You know, a lot of folks who work on the camp, who work in campaigns like I do, don't have a lot of Republican friends, so I get a lot of questions about my friendship with Kristen. Like, do you guys get along? Do you guys like really get along? Oh, yeah, no, we really get along. So it's, it's, it is possible, it is very important to mix it up a little bit. And increasingly, a lot of the polls show that people don't have friends of the opposite party. They're not socializing or mixing with other folks from different walks of life. And part of that is 
the nature of where people are moving, some of the trends that Kristen was talking about that you've probably seen in your own life. And some of it is this sense that we are feeling polarized, that we have a harder time talking to each other. We, people are unfriending their family members on Facebook. They're having a hard time speaking to people. They, they don't want to watch media that they feel is of a different political persuasion. So people are moving physically and emotionally into separate camps. So it is important sometimes to really challenge yourself to, to meet and talk to people of different points of view in a, in a way to kind of learn. That's the job of being a pollster, to really learn about uh, what other folks are thinking. So uh, to talk about some of the big trends, uh, I think the first trend that we thought we'd see that we in fact saw was the incredible surge of women candidates and women voters, which really honestly is is an incredibly satisfying, rewarding thing to see as somebody who's been working in democratic politics and focused on women's issues and women candidates and women voters for decades now. Um, so, and is really the reason the reason I studied politics and I uh, went to University of Texas, which is a school kind of similar to this, and that it's you know big and wonderful, and folks come from all over the country, and the weather is fantastic, and folks come from you know the cold northeast like I did um, to kind of uh, have a couple years in a warm area, and part of that was because I wrote uh, my high school paper following Ann Richards. Uh, gubernatorial race, I guess it was 1990, so it was, that was now quite a while ago. And then when she won, I thought, okay, I can now go to the University of Texas because she will be the governor of Texas. So that's that was my entry into, uh, into politics. And so I remember the last year of the woman, I was in college, and I remember people dressing up as Anita Hill and Clarence Thomas at Halloween parties, you know, at college that year because it was in the wake of the hearings that sort of spurred this new surge of women candidates running for office that in some way it kind of, you know, it is a precursor or foreshadowing, if you will, to what was a little bit of what we saw uh, this time. But going back to kind of the beginning of this cycle, the Women's March and the surge of women's candidates who have women's groups recruiting and training and talking to women candidates right away, women saying, I am running for office as a real reaction to 2016. Uh, the fact that there were women uh, women's marches on every single continent was something that I think I, I know personally a lot of Democrats found very restorative and healing after the loss in, in 16. And the number of women candidates who were announcing just kept growing and growing and growing until it was in the tens of thousands. And you see it here in Arizona specifically, perhaps more than others, where you had two women running against each other for Senate, which does not happen very often. Um, and I think four women won statewide in Arizona. Is that correct? I think um, for Democratic statewide uh, elected officials, which is a pretty exciting thing, and also not is also unusual. It's a little atypical, but is now you know reflects the surge in, in women candidates around the country. So there are um, a hundred, I think, a hundred new women uh, members of Congress, and women have done better on the Democratic side getting out of their primaries. There were so many competitive primaries running for con in the congressional primaries this time around. On the Democratic side, there were races with that were Republican seats with a Republican advantage of plus six, plus seven districts that maybe Trump won by, you know, a, a margin, maybe not an overwhelming margin, but some sort of margin. And there would be four or five qualified, pretty good Democratic candidates running for office in a primary and and sometimes more than one woman. And women were far more likely to emerge from those primaries than Republican women were likely to emerge from their primaries in races where there was no incumbent. So if you're comparing apples to apples. So there were more competitive primaries on the left. Women were doing a better job with more candidates in them. And women were doing a better job getting out of those primaries on the Democratic side. And so well-funded, folks on the left were becoming so well-funded, there was so much enthusiasm. The, the surge in candidates and how good these candidates were and how well-funded they were by low-dollar donors and people who were excited around the country really can't be overstated. I mean, this it's not simply about Trump or health care or the economy. It is really about the quality of the candidates. And, and it's hard to really see if you're sort of observing you know, nationally without digging into some of these races. And there are lots of folks who really study all the races around the country that you can read and follow. But it, it, what happens is you have people who um, you know, have, have thought about running for office before, or maybe haven't thought about running for office before, but they ha have 
you know, some kind of background that leads them to this moment. When you have newcomers, they don't have a voting record, which can be damaging. Or, you know, you have folks who have always thought and said, this is the year because it's a good year for Democrats. And so it just encourages sort of a higher uh, a, a quality of candidate where they are, you know, really ready to do the work. They come with a network. They're really excited. They're going to knock on doors. They're going to make the phone calls. They're going to study up on the policy. They're going to be excited to debate. And, and, and these are the folks that, that are more likely to be successful. If you are in a side where you know it's not going to be such a great year, I've been on those sides too, people have to be recruited and really asked to run. You have, to, you have a lot of folks flying out to the district and say, we really want you to run. Don't you want to run this year? And they're like, well, uh, and then you, maybe you have to go to your second or third or fourth choice. Do you want to really run? Okay, I'll run. And so it, this year, there, we didn't have that issue. Everybody who ever thought about running decided this would be a good year to run on the left, right? So, so that was part of the reason that you had so many Democratic successes, in addition to the, the, the theme of women candidates and women voters being really, truly excited. And, and uh, there are a variety of reasons for that, and I think we can, we can talk about how that manifests itself in the, in the outcome. And the first is, and we can talk a little bit about Trump in a minute, but views toward Trump obviously spurred a lot of that. A majority of Americans feel that Trump doesn't respect women. Um, you see, you know, that I think is reflected in how many women decided to run for office, how women feel about, um, about this election. And a lot of folks talk about white women, white college educated women in particular, who voted so heavily Democratic. But also at the same time, you have a lot of non-white women candidates who have just made an incredible impact on the Democratic field and have got voters excited all around the country. Um, it, it, whether you have women who uh, de uh, defeated Democratic incumbents in primaries, or where you have Stacey Abrams in Georgia, you have you know the first uh, Muslim woman uh, coming to uh, I think two Muslim women coming to Congress, two Native American women coming to Congress the first time that's happened. Uh, more Latinas coming to Congress. Uh, this new surge in in uh, women. Women who from all walks of life who are, who are run and have won is is really truly exciting uh, across the country for Democrats. It's something that you know. There's I saw somebody tweeted out a photo of like a diverse group of new women members, and it said like the Real Justice League, and it just went viral because women, you know, people were so excited about it. So it's something that is really hard to overstate that kind of enthusiasm that that's happened nationwide. Um, and the other thing too that is is particularly interesting is how women voted so Democratic for uh, this time around that Democrats were successful even though men voted Republican. And that's the first time that this has happened, to my knowledge, looking at exit polling. Because usually when Democrats have won, women and, Demo women and men have both voted Democratic, but just by different margins. Uh, when men have voted Republican and women have voted Democratic, Republicans have won. But this time, Democrats won. So women really did set the pace as voters and as candidates this time around more than ever before. Um, I think the other key point here is that campaigns matter and why these campaigns matter and why the message matters. Um, again, looking at a lot of these individual races, it's not simply about how did this person view Trump or you know what in like you know what kind of fun viral video they had. Although that stuff is interesting, I don't want to dismiss it at all. It's certainly how people get a lot of attention. It is not the beginning and end of how these races are decided. M.J. Hagar in Texas had this like incredibly viral video that the whole country, you know, stopped, paused to, to pay attention to. It was a couple minutes long about um, uh, her, uh, her um, experience, I think, in Afghanistan, and about doors was the theme with doors, where she felt doors were closed to her and you know, she would open them. And it was incredibly compelling. She was not successful. It's still a Republican district. Um, so, you know, it can't change the, the viral video. It may be, it is, I don't know if it's necessary. It's not sufficient, right? So these compelling stories are important and also matters what the fundamentals are in the, in the area. So it, it, it's important to look at how individual candidates, candidates have run and the message. And globally, nationally, you saw a lot of Democrats focus on health care. It was something that you could see begin to emerge after Ralph Northam's victory in Virginia in the gubernatorial race. It was crucially important. People said it in the exit polls. People said it in post-election surveys that we conducted that health care was really important. Well, he was a doctor in that case, so maybe the, you know, the counterpoint is, well, he's a doctor, so maybe that's why health care was important. But ultimately, that's something that continued to... to be salient to voters in poll after poll after poll. People said it was the most important issue. Um, Obamacare didn't 
resolve people's concern about health care. People still had worries about their health care. People still have health care challenges. They have to take care of their parents or they themselves have a challenge. And then with the threat of Obamacare repeal, the, the votes to repeal, the, uh, uh, the repealing the individual mandate, um, the slow walking of various regulations from the Trump administration, and so on. Those kinds of things have made people feel, well, this is really something that's under, under threat. Um, and and it, is, it was a message that worked in a lot of different areas and also could be tra transcending. It could transcend party lines. It doesn't have to be partisan. There are a lot of issues that don't have to be partisan that haven't always been partisan. They don't need to be partisan. Now, if some folks have wanted to make them partisan, you could pivot back to that by saying, look, I, I don't want this to be partisan. I think we should all have access to health care. And these are ways that Democrats Democrats could enter a toxic political climate where people are being very partisan and say, well, look, I have this personal health care challenge. I met people who have personal health care challenges. Let's all agree that if you have a sick child, a sick parent, you're, you yourself are sick, you should be able to get the health care you need. That's a way to bring, bring people in together as opposed to some of the more toxic back and forth things that you can sometimes see at the final stages of a political campaign. And that's something, if you read a lot of the postmortems of how Democrats were successful, the healthcare piece is something that really came up early that a lot of Democrats continue to use over and over again. It worked regularly in polling, came up regularly um, uh, in, in how people, people talked. Um, and then I think the last, uh, I guess two more things. The, the next piece is, uh, how do we talk about Trump? How do Democrats talk about Trump? I think some Republicans struggled a little bit about how to talk about Trump. I think some of the like Trump huggers did well. Some Trump huggers did not do well. I, I, that may not be cause and effect there. It could be, you know, as they say, correlation doesn't imply causation. I don't know if necessarily Trump hugging by itself is enough for a Republican to do well, but nor do Democrats always do well if they're ready, if they, all they want to talk about is Trump. Because when we talk about Trump, whether you're a Democrat or Republican candidate, it puts people into their corners. It puts, it, it makes someone say, okay, I know what side this person's on, so then I know what side I'm supposed to be on. Because Trump has People have very strong opinions about Donald Trump, I think it's fair to say, whether you're on the left or on the right. He doesn't have a lot of mushy, I'm not so sure, I somewhat favor, I somewhat oppose. He is very strong, there's very strong intensity on either side. And so, um, so for a lot of Democrats to be successful, it's really about talking to the Trump voter in a way that gives people permission to say, well, I voted for Trump in 2016, but now I feel like maybe I want something else. And that's by making voters not feel defensive by attacking Trump. And even if there are lots of things to, to be critical of the president about, and even if a lot of folks in the base feel very personally threatened by a lot of his policies and rhetoric, which, um, which is, you know, is a tension within how Democrats talk. Um, on the Republican side, I, I feel like there have been a lot of Republicans who have um, you know, not always been as authentic as maybe they personally feel about Trump, that maybe they wanted to be, maybe they personally feel more critical but felt that they couldn't be, um, or maybe f have been more enthusiastic because um, that's where they felt their district was, even if that wasn't sort of where they are. So I, I, I think you have a lot of candidates on either side who struggle to talk about Trump. And in fact, if you look at a lot of the ads, Trump is not front and center in a lot of ads of people running for Congress on either side. You saw a lot of people, you know, trying to talk about the issues in some way. And then I guess the final thing is, how do we look at polls and what grade do we give the polls and, you know, the day after the election? Kristen was more well-rested than me and she came in and, and I didn't, I was like, she gave them, you know, like a C plus. I was like, Okay, you know, because <laughs> I, 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 I have been I have been up a lot later, and I was like, okay, yeah, sure. And um, but I, you know, I think you know, I, I do think ultimately, while we were nationally, I think you know, in a couple places, particularly the big races that people were really following very closely, I think kind of changed people's perspectives perspectives of the night, whether it's Beto in Texas or the Florida races or the Georgia gubernatorial race. Ultimately, if you look at the individual congressional races and where decisions were made and which races people thought to, um, to invest in, a lot of that followed internal polling, not necessarily public national polls that we talked about a lot on, on television. Um, and those polls seem to lead people into the right direction. Um, you know, it had Virginia 10, Barbara Comstock, 
Uh, you know, that was always a race that was always going to be a toss-up. And that was a seat where internal polls on both sides said, this is, you know, this is moving solidly Democratic. And you could see resources move away, and, and the seat flipped and became Democratic. And you saw that in, um, uh, you know, in Colorado, uh, Michigan. I mean, there were a couple places where, you know, the resources really followed where the polls uh, suggested. And a lot of those places, um, those decisions were correct. If the polls were all wrong, you would see, you know, people, you would have seen somebody where resources were pulled away, but they ended up winning by a bit, or they came a lot closer than people expected. And while with so many races on the ballot, there'll always be a couple surprises, ultimately, I think there were fewer surprises at some of the micro level decisions that were made that are kind of hard to, in the kind of takeaway of, of Tuesday night for people to realize. Oh. All right, well, I think we're good. ready for questions yes. from you. Good, logistical issues aside, good. Um, thank you so much for all of that. And it's difficult for me to figure out where to begin. Let me, let me start with this. Uh, Midterm elections, we come up with that phrase because the presidency has become so dominant in the 20th century. So midterm elections typically are not good for the party of the president in power. If you step back a little bit, could you say this was not um, an awful election for the GOP, not great? Um, uh, there are elements of a wave here for the Democratic Party, um, but there are also ways in which um, it, it wasn't as bad an election as some incumbent presidents and their parties have had in the, in the past um, decade or more. Is that is that fair, or yeah, am I missing I, something? I think there are the there are data points that you could use. Look, if I was a press secretary for the RNC and I wanted to construct the case for why this was actually a pretty good night for Republicans, there are data points that would let you do it. Um, we, we picked up seats in the Senate in a year that was supposed to be terrible for Republicans. Uh, the blue wave, you know, did it, it crested about. You know, districts where Trump won by by about five points, but it didn't really get into you know the really really tough ter terrain like it did when Democrats got washed out in 2010. Uh, you saw Trump voters show up even though Trump wasn't on the ballot, which is something presidents have typically struggled to be able to do. So there are plenty of data points that I think you can point to to say this was not as bad for Republicans as it could have been. However, that doesn't necessarily mean it was a good night, I think. Yeah. I think part of the reason, too, why you're seeing Republicans be a bit more upbeat, or at least the morning after the election feeling a bit more upbeat, um, was the sense that they had, had made such gains in the Senate. Um, if you already sort of had assumed that Democrats were going to take the House, that's going to lead to more investigations, subpoenas, headaches for the Trump administration, the Senate, at least, can do things on its own. The Senate can confirm judges, can confirm appointees. And so if you are a more establishment Republican where you're not crazy about the president, you're not going to lose a ton of sleep about Don Jr. getting served a subpoena. But you really would like right of center judges to be confirmed to the courts. You still have a government that can provide you with all of those things. Uh, and so I think that's why Republicans came out of this midterm the morning after feeling like, it wasn't quite as bad as it could have been. And so relative to expectations and relative to history, feeling a little more upbeat. But I, I don't think, if you lose a chamber of con Congress, I think you in some ways lose the right to say you had a good night. Right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I think that's right. I mean, look, you know, the, I mean, at some level, everything had been quite stable. I mean, it's been a volatile couple of years, but some level it was stable. Like president's job approval rating, you know, moves in this kind of narrow bands between 37 and 43 percent approved, roughly, right, give or take. It's not as massive, it's not as volatile as his Twitter feed, right? So it's this, you know, kind of smaller band. Um, the generic ballot, which is a blunt instrument, it's just this question that lots of outlets ask, were you going to vote for the Democratic candidate or the Republican candidate for Congress? Everyone asks a little bit differently, but it's, you know, it's a metric that we have short of assembling all of the different House polling and Democratic 
head-to-heads with named ballots. And so that has shown, you know, between a six and nine point Democratic advantage most of the cycle. It never showed on average a Republican advantage. Occasionally it showed a Democratic advantage that was in the double digits, but it stayed kind of where in the same place the whole time. Um, so, it, you know, in that, in that sense, it was stable and as predicted. Um, I don't think there's really any argument that the Republicans had a good night other than, you know, Democrats, I, maybe some Democrats would have hoped to have won everything, right? Mm -hmm. So with the, everything that was, you know, available, right? To have a full repudiation of Trump, I think is what some people were saying that they wanted to see. Um, but we shouldn't see anything as short of that as something that's not a good night. I mean, you had people on the right saying, talking about a red wave. There was, there was no red wave. You had a couple, you had a few Republican Democratic senators in states that went heavily for Trump lose. Um, you had flipped chambers, you had more Democratic governors, you had, you know, new women from all over the country. I mean, it, by every measure, this was a very strong night for Democrats. The fact that it didn't crystallize quite that way on Tuesday, but took a few more days to kind of evolve, shouldn't change the fact that this was a really strong night for Democrats. Yeah, another long-term uh, view of this, you, you mentioned when you, uh, Margie, when you started studying uh, politics, being in university, I, I was uh, a university student um, at the end of the Reagan administration. Isn't it the case that we have now for three decades or more, um, back and forth in different elections at different levels, and what we, we have is still the absence of one party being dominant, right? In 2008, there was some sense among the Democrats that maybe this is a realigning election for a generation, that Democrats will resume the position they had for much of the 20th century, the, do the dominant national party. Is it the case that this election a, a, a better night for the Democrats and the Republicans, but it still fits this pattern we've had of back and forth, and back and forth, and or, or, or again, am I missing something? Is there a sign there that that perhaps this could be a, an important set of turning moments for Democrats? I mean, I don't know if I see it. I mean, I guess I think of a, a realignment as the labels mean something new entirely. I mean, maybe maybe there's some other definition of a realignment. But I think of a realignment as like Democrat and Republican meant one thing, and now they mean something else. And, and, and we're definitely not there. Um, now, do we have some groups that have moved more solidly in one way, and how long do they stay in, has stay in that pattern? I mean, Latinos are an example where there was a, you know, Latinos, you know, Republicans did much better with, Repu with Latinos under George W. Bush. I think there was after, you know, maybe it was at before, I don't know if it was after George W. Bush or after McCain, that you Republicans saying, like, we want to get to 40. If we get to 40, you know, or 44, that's going to be a good place for us. And that's not a strategy that the Republican Party under Trump, at least, is trying, it seems to be trying to, you know, trying to work on. So that may be, you know, part of, of you know, how the parties are defined. Suburban women or college-educated women may be part of, part of this. But ultimately, the Democratic values and what it means to be a Democrat and what it means to be a Republican, I'm not sure if those are changing, or at least are they changing into something else completely, or are they moving around? I guess some people might argue that the Republican definition, what it means to be a Republican, may be changing a little bit. I feel like what it means to be a Democrat, you know, despite thoughts of whether the party's moving to the left or becoming more progressive, I think it ultimately means what it's meant over the last few cycles, at least how voters take it. Maybe Kristen well, thinks differently. I, I think in politics, people think very short term, right? I can preach all day long about how important it is for Republicans to reach young voters, but if they go, yeah, but I just need to win the next election. I don't care how they're going to be voting two decades from now. I care how they're going to be voting the next time my name's on the ballot. I, I don't think politics lends itself to long-term thinking and planning, which is why I think in some sense talk of, well, one party has figured out the magic formula and they're just going to win forever is usually misleading. Um, I also think there's the complacency. Success breeds complacency sometimes. Um, you saw after the uh, you know, 2016 election, I think, even though, I mean, President Trump won a very large, uh, he, he won a sizable victory in the Electoral College, but you can also make the case that he won a very narrow victory because in a couple of those blue wall states, his win was razor thin 
you flip a couple thousand voters here and there, and suddenly you wake up in November 2016 saying, Republicans have a massive problem on their hands. They need to rebuild their coalition. Instead, they held both houses of Congress and the White House and said, hey, maybe we've got this figured out. Maybe we have the winning formula. So I think when you are the party that's in charge, it can be tempting to think you have the magic recipe. You don't need to change anything. And I, I'm hopeful that this midterm will be a, a, at least a modest wake-up call for Republicans that what worked in 2016 to piece together victories in some places on a razor's edge does not mean that they have figured out the way to win forever. And in fact, d demographics are still trending ever, ever so slowly, but still trending against Republicans unless they figure out a way to build a more diverse and more broad coalition. Let me follow up on that point. You, you mentioned different gaps, uh, both of you. Uh, but earlier on, um, and in fact, you both mentioned this, the idea of the suburbs, right? The geography of this, urban voters trending strongly toward the Democratic Party, rural voters trending strongly toward the Republican Party. This is obviously at the national level, but, but also um, state and local. Uh, is it possible that the suburbs represent a, a middle target for each party? Is it possible that in order to succeed at all levels in the 2020 cycle, each party would have to figure out how to speak toward the middle as well as to the bases that each thinks they have, conservative, progressive, urban, uh, uh, rural. Is that, could that be a significant change in the next couple of years? Well, I, I don't actually know that that would represent a change. I mean, the suburbs have always been kind of battleground territory. I think in the last couple of elections, they have leaned slightly Republican uh, and have been a piece of how Republicans were able to take control of Congress and the White House. Um, but losing those suburbs, even by small margins, if they go from being light red to light blue, that still will have huge electoral consequences. As we saw, again, with the number of, of House seats that Democrats were able to pick up in red states, but in the suburbs surrounding the, the little blue dots on the map, you know, if you map out every precinct in America and whether it's red or blue, you know, America looks very Republican because you have these rural areas where not a lot of people live, but they're very Republican. And these cities, a very small space, it's very blue. Lots of people live there. It can give this kind of misleading picture of, of what America looks like politically. And I think it's just do, do the urban areas, are they culturally pulling the suburbs closer to them politically? Or do the suburbs feel more alienated from what's going on in the big cities they surround? Um, and I think in this election, you saw suburbs being drawn a little more closely to the cities that they surround, which is how Democrats can put together those, those uh, victories in, in the sorts of places you might not have previously expected them to have a chance. And I think it's important too to think about tone versus issues and it, you know what makes somebody swing, is it because you know, some years they care about the economy and taxes in one way, or other years they care more about you know, health care or pre-existing conditions, does it make them swing in, in that way? Or do they swing because they feel that one party is just becoming too, um, too polarizing and they want somebody who's going to bring people together and try to come to some kind of common ground, even if people may disagree on some of the issues? And do those things have to be, you know, it, can you be uh, more moderate in your tone, but still have a point of view that's conservative or, or progressive. Um, those don't have to be mutually exclusive. You can be passionate and a centrist. You can be boring progressive or boring conservative. I mean, you can, you know, you can, it, they don't have to be all one for one. So it, it really, I think, is important that we think about that. And that matters very much too at the individual level, individual races. I mean, you look at Kansas, where Democrats were successful in a lot of the Kansas City suburbs and Johnson County and, and those areas. And they were looking for candidates who were going to be, you know, bring people together. In addition to the issues, they were also interested in people who were going to be able to bring people together and, you know, work with folks from, the, from all parties, not simply, not only about one political party. One last question for me, and then the student, we'll have our uh, pre-arranged uh, student leaders uh, with some questions. My, Last question is related to that about tone and, and issues or tone versus issues. What difference do you think it will make, each of you, um, that there will be more women in elected office, obviously substantial in the Congress, but also at other 
levels of, of elected office, state and local. Um, is, will that be uh, expressed in a different tone or different issues being emphasized, some mixture of the, of the two? So there's this, um, Nora Ephron wrote, you know, she wrote, before she was a director, she wrote screenplays and books that other people would direct, and she saw one of her books turn into a movie, and she said, well, I could do that just as badly. <laughs> and so I always think about that when I think about more women in elected office. They don't have, you know, women don't have to be better or even different in order to deserve parity in, in public life. I mean, they deserve parity because they deserve parity, because it, women are a majority of the electorate, never mind the decision making that goes on in so many households. So, um, so I don't, so I don't want to say it doesn't matter to me if women are better or not, they, but they don't have to be for me to find that important and valuable that there is parity. Um, you know, there, there is a lot of work and research about women who are, they, you know, they are more likely to try and work with, you know, across party lines. And I know that the women senators on the Hill have always had this, like, dinner or lunch group where they all from, you know, all of them from whatever, whatever state they're from have all, you know, kind of hung out and stuck together. And all those things that I, I think are nice stories. And I don't know if it's because there are fewer of them and, and it's harder to get there, therefore. And so there's something different about the ones who do. I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. I don't know how it's going to be now that there are so many of them. We'll see. That's fascinating and from so many different walks of life. I mean, it wasn't that long ago, 10 years ago, roughly, or 12 years ago, I worked with a woman candidate who came into Congress, and her husband was the first man to be president of the spout, Congressional Spouses Club. And like he would go to the Spouses Club. I mean, this was t 10 years, 12 years ago. It was not like 60 years ago. And at the Spouses Club, they would give out like nail polish and handbags, something like so gendered. It was really unbelievable. And anyway, so I don't know how, how it's all going to be now that there are so many women. I can't wait to see. Um, it, but women don't have to be better or more collegial or more cooperative or more focused on families or more any of those things. It's just great that there's more diverse representation so people can see someone who looks like them in, con in Congress. Yeah, I think there's, there was an interesting poll that we talked about on our show a couple of months before the election where voters were asked, um, do you think that women are just as uh, capable of serving in office as men? And both Democrats and Republicans overwhelmingly said yes to that question, thank goodness. Um, they asked, you know, do you believe that uh, you know, America would be better off with more women in political office? People of both parties said yes. But then they began asking questions more along the lines of, of what you said. You know, do you think that more women would lead to more compromise, more things getting done? And while Democrats, I think like a majority, were, were willing to say yes, Republicans were more reluctant on those questions. That the idea is not that women are somehow better at men at the job of governing, but that, that you know, we should not be thinking about it in terms of gender. I do, however, think that that's part of why there's a little less infrastructure on the Republican side to specifically target, recruit, and train women to run for office. So one of the things that, that, as a Republican woman, distresses me about this election is that we have all of this excitement and energy around the Year of the Woman 2.0. We're going to have over 100 women in the next Congress. This is so exciting. And yet, there will be fewer Republican women in Congress. Depending on how some of these close House races shake out, it could drop as low as 13. Um, right now, the last Congress, there were 23 Republican women, and that was a pitifully low number. That was less than 10% of the Republican conference. Dropping to 13 will be a disaster. Um, and I think, you know, if you go to Republicans and you say, well, hey, this is a problem because, you know, as a proportion of your party, I think those numbers arguments, it sounds like you're talking about quotas. It just sort of, it doesn't get people excited. But I think the idea that we need to be tapping in to the talent that our party has to offer, and that talent is going to be evenly distributed across people of all walks of life. And if we're not tapping into that, then we're leaving talent on the table, and we're leaving the opportunity to win some elections on the table. If you talk about it in those terms, suddenly Republicans start getting more excited about, hey, let's go recruit, retain, train, uh, get women candidates on the ballot and get them winning. And my hope is that this election will be a wake-up call that more of that needs to happen. Now for part three. Um, we have uh, some students who are going to ask uh, questions. Um, there are more questions I could ask. We didn't get to ask about uh, veterans, more, you know, some developments there, more veterans running for office and being elected to office. And also, the, you know, another gap is religious um, uh, voters, but maybe we'll have time for that 
So up to the microphone first, right? We have um, the president of an organization called Bridge ASU, which is the local chapter of, of Bridge USA, uh, a student group on several campuses across the country interested in promoting uh, reasonable discussion and dialogue across different political views. Uh, this is Josh Fixell, and after that we will have um, the Director of Civic Engagement for the Undergraduate Student Government um, here on the Tempe campus, Hannah Salem. But first, Josh. Yeah, hi. Thank you guys for your talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, with, the, uh, with the Democrats retaking the House and the Republicans still holding on to the Senate and the presidency, do you guys see this as leading to incre an increase in polarization? Or since now both parties have to work together, do you think Americans will start to be working together more? So I wish I could give you a more <laughs> optimistic answer. Um, <laughs> I, I, I'm not optimistic that this new divided government is going to lead to an infrastructure bill. I mean, the, the joke in Washington is that it has been infrastructure week every week of the Trump presidency, and that by the time you hit Tuesday of Infrastructure Week, it is what did the president just tweet now week. Uh, and so Infrastructure Week never happens. With a Democratic Congress and a Republican Senate, I'm, I'm not as optimistic. The other thing to bear in mind is that the Republican conference, think about who just lost among the Republicans. It's all the moderates. Um, now the, the Republican conference is much more sort of boiled down to its most conservative members, the, the least willing to kind of deal. Now, Democrats may not need those votes. Again, they can, if they can pass things with all Democratic votes. But will those be the kinds of things that can then even get on Mitch McConnell's agenda in the Republican Senate? Probably not very likely. Um, so I don't believe that the next year is going to be this beautiful moment of bipartisan policy making, unfortunately. I, I think um, both parties in some ways view it as in their interest to prevent the other side from being able to claim a victory. Uh, if you are Democrats in Congress, you may want to get an infrastructure bill done, but you really want President Trump to be able to go out and give speeches talking about the beautiful new infrastructure that he's building. Um, I, I just think those are the sorts of political realities that are unfortunately going to lead to more gridlock, even less getting done, and voters being even more frustrated when we hit the next election. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree in being pessimistic. I mean, we're in kind of the the afterglow of an election where we're talking about what's happening and who won and who lost and who was successful and what they did and what's still being counted. Um, but when everyone comes to Washington to, you know, to and session starts and the new Congress comes in, um, I, I think it's going to be back to, you know, what we've had. And, and that leadership comes from President Trump. And he, he has not shown an interest in bipartisanship to get things done because if he had then there would we would have had an infrastructure week that would have been that would have you know happened earlier as something that everyone would have really actually tried to come together to do something on or at least you know in at the outset and he's had deals for on other issues immigration and such that he's then you know found a way to dismantle so i, I just don't feel optimistic I, I i wish that this wasn't the case you know because people get their cues from how the dialogue goes and if the dialogue is gridlock and shutdowns and you know fiscal cliffs and partisan gridlock and so, and so on and fighting then people just feel that you know nothing's getting done they're going to just feel continue to feel that Washington dysfunction is you know the most the most pressing problem we have which is what more more Americans increasingly feel is our number one problem more than anything else okay um, Hannah Salem who's uh, from undergraduate student government here on the Tempe campus. Thank you. So one of undergraduate student government's missions is to promote civic engagement and voter education. We've hosted plenty of events where we've helped students register to vote, educate them about ballot initiatives and candidates that are on the ballot, and we actually have a ballot center on ASU's campus um, promoting the convenience of voting, and students have the option to turn in their early ballot or vote in person. So my question to you is, do you think the role of student organizations has impacted the midterm election results? And what more can student organizations do to promote the spirit of civic engagement when it's not an election year? I think that young people played a huge role in this last election. Again, you saw young people, the, the conventional wisdom is, well, they don't really participate in these midterms. And I think when the voter files come back and we take a look at who actually voted, you're going to see a lot of new voters, a lot of young voters, and I think they're going to have played a huge role. And I think on campuses, 
having an environment where people are telling their peers, go vote, it matters. Um, I think in some ways that's so much more powerful than like, another celebrity making another video. Like I know the day of the election, like Beyonce posted a picture on Instagram of like she was in, like a Beto shirt, which I'm sure Beto's team might have preferred that she do that before like four o'clock in the afternoon on election day. Um, but you know, I mean, people would say like, oh, Taylor Swift, she just endorsed in the Tennessee race. Like, isn't that doesn't that mean that Phil Bredesen is well? Phil Bredesen didn't win. I, you know, is, uh, Taylor Swift, I love her. She, I, she's very influential. But I think what's more powerful is when someone you know who's in your life and on your campus and you trust says, hey, this is important, come with me. Um, and so I think that's why student organizations are hugely valuable. And I'm really glad that you on this campus have both college Republicans, college Democrats, nonpartisan groups like you guys doing this work. Because I think it, it takes being asked by a friend to really sort of get it through the first time, like, OK, this matters to me. So I think absolutely. So a lot of the studies show that you know making sure people feel like they are with people who vote. They are told by their friends and neighbors to vote. There's lots of work to make sure people are organizing where they live rather than sort of parachuting from someplace else and say, "Hi, I'm I'm here to help." Can everybody everybody here decide to vote? But having someone that they know or seems to be from the community really makes a difference. So I think that's important. Maybe it's having some kind of like you know, college student checklist. Like, here, what are the things that are important? Let's all think about what are the five issues we'd want to know about all the, you know, any candidate running for office, what they, you know, what they, how they feel about college tuition or, you know, pre-existing conditions or, you know, job training or something that you feel, or tech jobs, like something that you feel is relevant to, you know, the, the folks in your organization and you could just boil it down to a couple questions and use that as something to, as people can see, as a guide for all the candidates who come through. And the other thing is, this is a really big school in what is now going to be considered a battleground state. You know, you guys hold the cards. Like, you can, you know, demand that candidates running for any kind of office, like, come here and talk to you guys. Like, this is, you know, the, you can now demand the attention um, that, a, that a battleground state and a huge population of students and a major population center can deserve. Thank you. Okay, our next two uh, student questions. We have Alex Baker, who's vice president of the Arizona State University Young Democrats. And following him will be Jonah McCoy, who is a major in our school, and also a member of the College Republicans United. So, Alex. Hi. Um, yes, okay, there we go. Uh, one of the issues that I ran into while interning with a uh, targeting and polling firm this summer was the issue of non-response rate, specifically among uh, youth and people under 35. Like you said, to do, say, one of the live polls that New York Times hosted, it was 40,000 calls for 500 respondents, mm -hmm. but the response rate among people over 65 might have been one in 10, but the response rate among people under 35 would be one in 90. Obviously, this leads to a lower sample size and probably poor accuracy, and I know anecdotally that among my friends, no one really likes to pick up a call from a number they don't know. If it's important, they'll leave a voicemail. How would you see polling firms tackling this upcoming issue of non-response rates? And because given the um, noticeable age and partisan divide that people under 35 have exhibited in exit polls, a poor level of accuracy on that front would lead to poor polls in general. Do you see something on the horizon that polling industries could potentially implement to counteract this? I mean, there's more online polling, you know, that's one way. I mean, there's, so there are a couple things, right? One, every public poll now and internal polls has a larger percentage of a cell phone, you know, polls conducted on people's cell phones than even just a few cycles ago or a few years ago. So now it's now become industry standard across the board. That number has to be high. It has to be at least 40%. If you have outlets that do less than 40%, it's seen as, you know, not quite right it, because it's so, it's so expensive. I mean, that it's so much more expensive to reach people on their cell phones. So that's part of the reason that it, people have been slow to adopt it. So that's one thing that people are doing, and that makes a difference. You have some outlets that do online, or they do online instead of cell phones as a way to reach, and it's a way to reach younger people. It's not always possible for congressional district level polls, or if you're doing a legislative district poll, doing online is a lot more complicated, much harder, if not impossible, to do. So there, you really need to do cell phones. Um, and it just means doing callbacks. It means you can't be in the field just one night. You have to be in the field multiple nights. You have to try being in the field over different times. You have to be aware of the population that you're targeting. And, you know, is it a holiday where people go home and so on? Or, or, or is it, a, you know, 
how big is your student population and if that's a sizable place in the area you're calling, sometimes you have to change how you do your field work. It depends a lot on where you're calling. If you're doing interviewing in Vegas, for example, you may be more open to calling a little bit earlier or a little bit later because you know if you're calling in Vegas, people are home at different hours than they are in different places. So you know some of these things just mean being more aware of the place that you're calling, but it's a challenge everybody faces. I will just add three words that will strike fear into the heart of everyone here. Polling by text. Oh, God. <laughs> I, I would not be surprised if, maybe not in the next election, but four years from now, six years from now, I think that's where a lot of this is headed. Interesting. All right. And Jenna McCoy. All right. And my question will be is that it's a popular rumor amongst many conservatives that the coming Generation Z is going to be much more conservative than the millennials have been. So I want to ask you both if you think there's any truth to this rumor or if you think it's a little nonsense. And regardless of, do you think that these Gen Zers who've grown up in such a political atmosphere will go out to vote more than their millennial predecessors at their age? That's a great question. Um, I think it's too soon to tell what the political character of Gen Z will be. Um, the evidence that I've seen suggests that they are just as progressive, if not slightly more so. With perhaps the notable exceptions, I've seen some data that says there may be a little more conservative on immigration, which I think is interesting. But it's, these, are, these are like isolated data points. They're not things I'm confident enough in yet to be like, yes, this is what Gen Z believes. Um, I think in part because so much of Gen Z is still under the age of 18, has still not yet shown up on a college campus or graduated from high school still very hard legally to survey. Um, so I still think we are, the picture of that generation is developing. Um, I think when you think about millennials, it's a very big generation, right? I, I was born in the mid 80s and I am a millennial as is anyone who was born in the mid 90s. We may not in some ways have a whole lot in common, um, but we grew up in an era where the internet was pretty much the norm. We have memories of the financial crisis. Um, we have memories of uh, the Iraq war for the most part. Uh, some of us have memories of 9-11. And these are all things that I think sort of shaped our political identity. For Gen Z, I think it's gonna be that their entire lives have you've had access to smartphones, um, that their adult life is sort of beginning with the Trump era, the, the end of the Obama era and the start of the Trump era. And I don't yet know what that will mean as far as the, the imprint that will make on their generation, but it, it wouldn't surprise me if they wind up being different than millennials in some way. Do you have any thoughts on No, that? I mean, look, it, it, I think it will have to depend on, you know, how, what is the verdict on the end of the Trump administration and how that evolves. I mean, you know, especially when you have this new crop of really young candidates, most of them on the left, and do they stick around for a few cycles in a way that gets younger people really excited? And, you know, you also, I mean, I also am kind of, can sometimes dismiss the sort of celebrity engagement in politics. On the other hand, that is how a lot of younger people really, you know, get engaged in politics and so, or at least become early exposed to politics. So do some people reject it, at, you know, reject the sort of uniformity of celebrity involvement in politics in a way that makes them, you know, th those who lean Republican become more conservative or does it, you know, kind of change how younger people are more broadly? You know, these are, I think these are still open questions. Thank you. Can I just follow up on that before we turn over the, the mic over to general uh, questions from the audience? You, both of you have, have agreed that this election s says something significant about uh, youth voting and, and younger uh, elected officials holding office, and also about women. Will those two factors, um, are they likely to affect how the Democratic leadership in the House approaches the question of how strongly to oppose President Trump, how strongly to use the subpoena power, how strongly to make an issue of the president as personal figure per se. Will they, will they think that youth voters or women voters might respond um, unpredictably to that? They might be careful about that? Or would they have a sense that, no, the youth vote and the women vote is a vote to the progressive left and it will boost them toward being um, more, more aggressive with the president. I think that's going to be a district by district, candidate by candidate decision. You know whether or not people f how people feel, the, you know voters in their districts feel, and it's going to depend on the member and what that member's role is. 
You know, I think, and you know, it's obviously some folks who came in came in where there are competitive primaries, no competitive generals, and that's a little bit different than somebody who's going to be in a battleground seat that votes Republican in presidential elections. So I think that's going to just depend on on who and where we're talking about. Um, but you know, I think voters want to see they want to see the new Congress focus on the issues that matter to people and making sure that they're helping people in, in their daily life. And at the same time, that they also don't want to see the Congress be yes men to Trump and yes men and yes women to Trump. And they want to see, and they want to see this from Republicans, but they are hoping to see it from Democrats, people who are going to protect us and Trump from his instincts, from his worst instincts. And so, you know, so whether that means um, accountability and oversight in some places, or whether that means, you know, m making sure to protect the country from, you know, some of the more egregious Trump policies. I think those are all things that are going to be on the table. So as somebody on the outside of the Democratic Party, kind of the way I see it is that something that surprises people is when I tell them that the average age of a Republican in Congress is like lower than the average age of a Democrat in Congress. Like, allow me to blow your mind for a moment. Ted Cruz and Beto O'Rourke are about the same age. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that. Uh, you know, that, that Republicans actually have an awful lot of young people in Congress. Um, they just don't necessarily connect with other young people and win enough young voters. Um, I, and this is, uh, I, I am citing this as a thing I read on Twitter, so take it with all of the, the veracity that implies. Yeah, but that the, the crop of young candidates that just won on the Democratic side has lowered the average age of a Democrat in the House by like 10 years. Like It's like enormous. And so my question from the outside, and I'm interested to see how Democrats resolve this, is do you stick with the same leadership that has been leading the party in Congress for a long, long time, or do you say, hey, we've got a new crop of young people in. Is it time for us to have a new generation of leadership step up? And as someone who's going to be sitting on the outside watching that, I am really excited to see how Democrats resolve that tension. We have time for a few minutes um, of questions from the audience. So if you come to the microphone in the center aisle, um, our two basic rules about short questions apply. Please do keep it short, and please make sure it's a question. Go ahead. All right. Hi, my name is Haseel Felix, and I'm a freshman political science major here at ASU. My question is regarding Arizona. So as we know, yesterday, Kirsten Sinema, the Democrat, was declared the winner of the U.S. Senate race here. And my question is, what do you believe this implies for Arizona, as we see now that we'll have a senator on the ballot every two years for the next six years because of the special election? So what does Kirsten Sinema's win in a state that hasn't seen a Democratic senator since Dennis DiConcini mean for us Arizonans? I mean, it's, you know, I think it's great. Look, I think Arizona's battleground state now. You know, I think in 2016, there was talk about expanding the map to... Arizona and Clinton came here and there was a, you know, a whole debate over that and is that trying, was it trying to get the Trump team to spread their resources? You know, you have all that debate. I think now Arizona can be con considered part of the larger battleground. Is it one of the like top two or three battlegrounds? Probably not, but it is, you know, can be part of the field more than it's been in past elections. And I think that's, you know, I think that's hugely important, especially given how uh, Senator Flake in a former Senator Flake and late Senator McCain and their approaches to Trump too, I think, or their, you know, how they talk about Trump, I think is also, I think part of the conversation and can be continue to be part of the conversation, at least in the short term, even though obviously neither of them are senators right now. So I think that's something, you know, that we'll see evolve. But I think it's been, you know, and I think the last point is how, and this should be a low bar, but how kind of the recount late call process in Arizona went smoothly relative to other states, I think is, you know, it is, I think, something that people were like, oh, look at, Ari look at Arizona. Like, there's a lot that people are now looking at Arizona today as a, a model of something. And I think it's interesting that you've had so many women candidates or women Democrats and Republicans. I think all of that is a particularly interesting phenomenon unique to Arizona that I think, you know, is going to make the state a model, or at least, of interest for folks going forward. Okay. Perfect. High challenge. Um, uh, Kristen, your colleague on ABC, Matthew Dowd, uh, expressed concern that, um, as you said in your uh, opening remarks, the takeaways you had about the shift of voters uh, for the Democrats toward the metropolitan areas and the surrounding suburbs and more 
the rest of the state in the less populated areas to the Republicans. That although this is the most representative uh, Congress that we'll probably see uh, in the history of this country, that it's possible that there is a more tribalistic uh, division than uh, we're going, that we're going to see as opposed to before. Do you share that concern? And uh, have you and Margie seen any uh, polling in uh, exit polling from the midterms that has suggested that that is the case? Well, there's, there's a, a data point that actually came from before the election um, that, that makes me worry about the, the, uh, the division in America. Well, one, in the exit polls, 76% of Americans said that they believe that the country is going to be more divided and is, is getting more divided. Uh, only a, a small portion said they think the country is becoming more unified. And actually, they tended to vote, vote pretty Republican. Um, but the 76% the that said we're getting more divided, I mean, that's that's... That, that says something. We are, we are united in our belief that we are divided, and that's, that's about it. Um, is, there was a, a study that was conducted that asked people, do you believe you are a strange, do you feel like a stranger in your own country? And this was something that people on both the left and the right said yes to. Um, that if you're politically progressive, you can look at a country that just nominated Donald, that elected Donald Trump president, that sees the sorts of things that he says and does on a daily basis, and yet he still has 44% of the country that approves of the job he's doing, and go, what is going on here? And at the same time, you can be a political conservative. You can look at sort of pop culture, Hollywood. You can look at these midterms and think, you know, gosh, people say that they're, you know, if I say Merry Christmas to someone, I have to worry that I'm offending someone. I, that, that's, this is different than the country I grew up in. And so people on both sides can feel like they are a stranger in their own country. And I think if you feel like your way of life is under siege, that can lead to, I mean, that's the type of thing that, uh, you know, very bad political leaders have taken advantage of in, in past decades and centuries. Um, and so, you know, I do worry about the division in this country, and I, I don't think that this midterm is going to lead us to having more, more unity. I think it's going to take leadership at the very top with a, who really wants to unify this country uh, for us to begin moving that direction. Yeah, I mean, there, there have been a couple other data points along those lines. The things were, that were not partisan before are now partisan, like views toward trade or trade agreements or the FBI or... You know, I'm old enough. I'm literally old enough to remember when climate change was not so partisan, and that's you know the, obviously not true anymore. But there are lots of issues like that. I, I, I don't think our whole national dialogue is going is um, you know focuses around views toward trade agreements, or, or for example. But the fact that our views, or even you know views toward Russia and, and whether or not it's an ally. I mean, the fact that so many of these things, uh, views and public opinion, are susceptible to. Being, to becoming more partisan with the pressure of a White House who wants to make it so, for me, is troubling. I guess class half full is we can perhaps come back together uh, at some point on some of these things. We don't need to have every single issue be so partisan. But there was a time where you would release poll top lines and it would say, okay, 40% feel this way and 30% feel this way. And now every poll top line has to be divided by party because the differences are so massive, it's almost not worth looking at the overall because the differences are, are, are so massive. And so I don't really see it as, you know, suburban or urban or this or that as much as it's, you know, the party... But the party divide is really quite stunning, and it doesn't seem to be getting any better, and it permeates every topic, or nearly every topic. Okay, next question. Good evening. Oh, good evening. Um, while, I, while the election... Speak while the, right into the microphone, if you would, yeah. Gotcha. So while the election here in Arizona for the Senate was going on, one of the major complaints I heard from the Arizona Republican and some other folks was that there was a lack of transparency about the two candidates we had, Kirsten Sinema and Martha McSally. Mainly their main complaint being that there was only one debate between the two of them in the entire election campaign. Do you think that this is, was that a trend across the country of this kind of lack of transparency about the candidates? And do you think that's going to become a greater trend, or was that something more unique to Arizona? You know, I don't know. 
about that, Margie. Did you see any trends on that front? I mean, I know there were other races, like in Florida, there were multiple debates there between the governor's candidates. I think at the Senate race, there really was not a ton of, of debate between Nelson and Scott. I mean, I think in each race, candidates make a different calculation of, hey, does the, does the public in this state not know me well, and so a debate gives me an opportunity to say who I am to these voters? Or if you're someone who has been in office a while, maybe you feel like your brand as a candidate is already out there and you don't want to risk a misstep, maybe you avoid it. I mean, I think transparency, authenticity, these are things that, that are, are good and help engender goodwill among voters. But I do think it's something where candidates on an individual basis are kind of calculating, what's the risk that in this debate something's going to happen where I might look bad, I might get caught on something, uh, versus if I just played it safe, you know, and I'm sitting at 52%, I don't want to rock the boat, versus if you are someone who's lesser known, a debate can really give you a chance to shine. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. It really depends on the race. It depends on the candidates. It depends on what they can negotiate. It depends on the pressure that the local media outlets are putting on the candidates. Um, and, you know, debates are not always, the, unfortunately, the most watched things on television. So it depends on what outlets, you know, want to host the debate. And, and, and so it depends on a lot of factors. So I don't know if I see a debate trend per se. I, I feel like in the races that we worked on, there were, de, you know, the same number of debates that we can expect to see elsewhere with the incumbent sometimes holding the cards and not wanting to have a debate with a candidate who is a little bit lesser known because they don't want to give that candidate more oxygen or more you know, opportunities than, than they need to. That's just the calculation that different candidates make. But in an open seat, you know, there's an incentive for both candidates to, you know, want to want to debate. And as far as transparency goes, I mean, you had Cinema and McSally are, are members of Congress, so you know, they do have transparency in, in their votes that are you know, infinitely searchable, too. The, the one thing that I would just add that I think made the Arizona race so interesting is that you had two candidates who had to really reshape their political identities uh, on their way to the general election. I mean, Martha McSally was someone who had been quite critical of President Trump, who, in order to take on two pretty strong Trump supporters in that primary, knew she would need to have a message that was more supportive of the president, more supportive of things like building the wall, et cetera. And so, you know, kind of had to, to make that shift in tone. Meanwhile, Kirsten Cinema had been sort of a, a strong progressive who had to run a campaign that sort of wooed Republicans. I'm a business-friendly candidate. I mean, she wound up, of all the Democratic candidates who were on the uh, ran for Senate in this election, I believe only Joe Manchin won more Republican voters in his state. I think Kirsten Sinema winning 12% of all Republicans is what enabled her to win. And I think if you put yourself in a debate environment, it suddenly means that, the, that those flip-flops you may have made or those shifts in your identity are, are under a bit more scrutiny than they are when your message is primarily getting out there via the ads that your side is putting on television. And, you know, with McSally, I mean, McSally would say, you know, I support protections for pre-existing conditions, even though, you know, her votes don't support that. This is something that, you know, you saw lots of Democrats and Republicans, that particular, that particular debate of a Republican saying, I, su I support coverage for pre-existing conditions, and the Democrats saying, which you voted for this, that, that guts that, and, and having that debate happen in lots of different races around the country, just like it did here. Okay. Um, we have many students at the question and uh, less time than, than we would like. So let's do lightning round, okay? Okay. Really quick question from each student and a really quick question from our, our guests. All right, it's tough, to, um, it's tough to argue that the blocking of Garland and the confirmation of Kavanaugh hasn't cast our judiciary in a more partisan light. Will there be a growing consensus among pollsters to respond? Will judges start getting approval ratings and will, say, 538 start drawing maps of which local judiciaries might flip? Probably not to the latter, but, you know, uh, I think, I mean, I guess I would say you're absolutely right that people feel the judiciary is more political and the Supreme Court is more political. There are favorables of all the different Supreme Court justices and people through their nomination process, and people were comparing how, you know, Kavanaugh did compared to other people at the same point in their process, and he performed unfavorably, yet he's still going to be on the court. You know, I think there's a long-term view toward our institutions. I'm less, I, I don't think there's going to be tracking of 
down ballot judicial races and you know in a, in a way that we can all follow nationally though I, I just the only thing I would add is that uh, I think an independent judiciary is really important and that means a judiciary that is not influenced by politics and so if the law says one thing and 90 percent of voters in a poll say another thing you, you as a judge should be following the law. And so I would hate to create an environment where we create a culture where we're pressuring judges to take stances because of public opinion. I think that is what lawmakers are for. Lawmakers should be making laws responsive to public opinion, and that's then what judges should be interpreting and enforcing. Okay, next question. Do you think that the political tribalism in, the Amer in America has affected the bipartisanship with Republicans less revote less voting on Democratic bills and vice versa? Yeah, we've seen a big shift in the makeup of who is a Republican and who is a Democrat in Congress over the last few decades. It used to be that you had a lot of conservative Democrats and you'd have some progressive Republicans and they could find things that would work together. And a lot of that has just gone away. When you track sort of the the ideological leanings of who's in which party. I mean, the idea, centrists have in some ways gone away. Part of that is gerrymandering, that now you have so many districts that are carved out in such a way that once you win the primary, you've won. Um, but you also have polarization in the Senate, and the Senate's not gerrymandered. The states are all still the same shape. Um, and so, you know, I think there's, there are other forces, too, that have just made it more challenging for the, the People don't feel an incentive to work across the aisle right now. Even if you ask voters, do you want to see more bipartisanship, we could do a poll right now and we'd find 70, 80 percent of people say, I want more bipartisanship. But when it comes down to it, a lot of people, they think bipartisanship means the other party behaves more like me. Okay. I'm sorry. Last two questions and then hopefully we can have some time for a conversation over the taco bar because Margie and Kristen are going to stay for a bit. So over the campaign, uh, we saw a lot of different types of ads being put out by both parties. And so I was wondering, I saw a lot more attack ads being put out, and they seem more and more vicious as the political climate gets more and more volatile. I was wondering if, in today's society, political attack ads work better than uh, just say, stating what supports a specific candidate's positions. It's always been true that contrast of ads are more memorable, that something that's more in the negative is more memorable for folks. There are lots of different, you know, not every contrast ad is a negative ad or is bad necessarily because I think, you know, a lot of times you're, you know, you're telling people about the record of somebody, which is important information that they don't have, that someone is not going to put out about themselves, but they may want to know. And I think that's, you know, important for campaigns to hear. You also have the, cam the ads that people are putting out themselves versus the ads that come from outside groups. And those have a different tone, but... You know, you're right in that people do feel like despondent and just completely worn out by advertising when it comes close to the election. And I think, you know, one solution to that is for people to, you know, to do research and try to learn or read articles or look at what their ed board, their local editorial board says about a candidate. It's tough to sift through what the candidates say. Um, about themselves, and, but we shouldn't just rely on that. We should also rely on information other than what the candidates say about themselves. Last question. Uh, you both predicted that bipartisanship at the federal level is most likely not going to happen. Uh, given that, which party stands to benefit more from partisan gridlock in the 2020 cycle? Ooh, good question. Um, I think the reason why that's hard to answer is because, you know, if voters really want a change again two years from now, that's not good news for President Trump, right? He won because people wanted change. In fact, he won. If you ask voters, do you have a favorable or unfavorable view of, of Donald Trump? Donald Trump got votes of a quarter of the people that said they didn't like him because they were like, I don't like the guy, but he's, he'll be different. Um, once you're the incumbent, you lose some of the ability to make that case. And if there's more gridlock and people still think we're on the wrong track, that could be a, a big problem for him. I think if he was able to sign a couple of bills, it would be a good thing. Um, that doesn't mean that I think he's going to be able to get Congress to send him bills, but I, I think he would be in a better position if he could point to more achievements, you know, cutting more deals with Chuck and Nancy, well, I guess just Nancy, Mitch and Nancy. Right. Um, you know, I think we all lose with this partisan gridlock. I mean, it's just, you know, every fo every single focus group, I, I mean, I don't know how many focus groups I moderated this year, but 
dozens, dozens and dozens. And every single one, I would start off by saying, how's it going in your community? How are things going around here? And people say, oh, it's great. There's a new soccer field. And you know, we had the whatever festival. And my kids like their teacher. I'm like, OK, great, great, OK. Uh, how's it going in Washington? I'm just going to turn change topics. And everyone's like, oh, god. And it's, you know, people just feel really anxious and upset about how things are going. And it comes from what's happening in politics. And I don't see a short-term improvement there. And that makes me sad for where we're headed. And I wish I could end on a more optimistic note. But um, so, you know, I, I, and I don't, I don't want to think about which party profits off of, um, off of partisan gridlock, because I think all voters are suffering from it. Well, I'll, I'll end on an optimistic note, okay. which is that, I mean, you had turnout in this midterm election that was extraordinary. Yeah. That looked more like a presidential year than a midterm year typically does. And that means that even if people are turning out because they're mad, because there are emotions and we would rather voters not all be feeling across the country, I mean, the fact that people are turning that frustration into political action is a good sign. It's a sign that the the organs of democracy are still working. And, and I think that's something to feel optimistic about as we head toward 2020. Uh, civic health, that's great. Okay. <laughs> uh, but you can disagree with her at the taco bar if you want. Um, just a few closing notes. Uh, students, but of course anybody, because you can spread the word, uh, even if you're not a student, about our courses, our major and our minors information at the tables outside, and also information about the polarization and civil disagreement series as it picks up after the new year in, in January. Uh, we have Arthur Brooks, uh, but also outside our major series, we have a Martin Luther King event, um, a mini conference of, of scholars in mid-January January talking about that. Um, thanks to our terrific uh, events and communications team in the school, Dr. Carol McNamara, our Associate Director for Public Programs, um, Ty and Catherine and Taylor and Lauren and Gala and Kim and our student workers. Thank you to our student uh, partners, the student groups who are here tonight. And I see a couple of information tables here over the side for our student groups. Of course, please come to the Skettle table first and get information from us and then go over to the student uh, tables. Um, we do hope you'll stick around for the taco bar. We hope to see you at future events that the school sponsors. But for now, please join me one last time in thanking Margie O'Mara and Kristen Sokas-Anderson. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you so much. Terrific.